Hello friends! For today's video, I'm going to be chatting through three new fantasy releases. The books would be The Last Heir to Blackwood Library, The Thorns Remain, and The Salt Grows Heavy. I'll have timestamps in the description bar down below if you'd like to skip ahead to any one specific book, but I'll go ahead and kick it off with The Last Heir to Blackwood Library. This one is a little bit of a hybrid in that it's a mix of fantasy, gothic horror, and historical fiction. The setup is that we follow a young woman named Ivy who has lost pretty much everything that she's ever really cared about. Her brother and her father both lost their lives during World War I, and then her mother passed away not too far from when her brother and father died as well. And they never really had a whole lot of money, but they had a whole lot of love, and their family was generally pretty happy, and Ivy was happy with her life, but now that she's lost her family, the fact that she doesn't have a whole lot financially is really hitting her. It's a difficult time to be a young woman all alone in the world. And so she discovers that she is the last heir to this abbey. And it makes sense for her to go ahead and accept the inheritance because otherwise she's not sure what her future has in store. So you can already probably piece together where the gothic horror Vibes are going to come into place because once she arrives at this abbey, it's very old, it's very mysterious, it's out by the moors, and it's a little bit more of a, a rural area. And a lot of what's transpiring within the abbey seems very mysterious. If it's not clear, the abbey's been now something that people can live within. So it's essentially like a large house. But there is just so much to it that she's very confused by. There's some staff that work for the Abbey, that she is now the lady of the house and that they work for her. And they all seem to know something that she doesn't know, but nobody's really saying anything. And then she starts to kind of lose some sense of reality where she's questioning if her memories are accurate and there's just mysterious things occurring. And I thought that this both was to the book's benefit in establishing that feeling of what's going on, that gothic horror, the mystery, the terror that you would feel in that setting where you're removed from everyone you've ever known, everything you've ever known, and this place that you live in, it just feels like you've gone to the past and that there's something sinister within the house. But at the same time, it was a little bit the book's detriment, to the detriment of the book, I should say, uh, in my opinion at least, because the main character starts to become very much an unreliable narrator. And the specifics to that you discover as you're reading. And I like the idea of a horror story where the narrator is becoming unreliable because it just makes you start to question everything. It makes you look back and wonder, what can you trust that's being told to you? And are there indications that something is real and something isn't real? And why is that person behaving that way? Is that person... do do they recall something that happened, but she doesn't recall something that happened and that's why they're acting strange or is that person acting strange? Because they are strange and it really messes with you, which is exciting. But I do think that there were some relationships between characters that it felt like suddenly were quite absent. And then on top of that, the main character gets to a point where she, she goes from being likable and processing a lot when it comes to grief, trying to determine her place in the world, especially her place alone in the world. So she's trying to go through all of that, and I liked her a lot initially, but then she becomes really reckless, and it's like all intelligence kind of flew out the window, and I understood that there were aspects to the story that kind of backed up some of her decision-making, but then other decisions she would make were asinine. They didn't make any sense, and she just suddenly wasn't... Well, she is obviously not thinking clearly for a lot of the book, but in a way that it didn't... Some of the ways in which she didn't act logically, it didn't seem related to some of the horror elements. It just seemed like she suddenly became really stupid, <laughs> and that really frustrated me. It really irked me, because there was an easy way around some of these things, I thought, or really up the unreliability, I guess you could say, of the story really make it so that everything is up for question. And you could have certain characters trying to convince her like, no, no, this already happened. And go ahead and have some of the more sinister players trying to convince her of things. And then other people trying to say like, no, that's not true. And then have a situation where she trusts the word of one person over the word of another, as opposed to just 
deciding to go along with something when she is able to think clearly. Because that's what she does. She's able to think clearly in certain moments and then in her clarity makes really bad decisions. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> so I liked the atmosphere. I would definitely read something else by this author. And there were, I really, really liked it for the beginning portion of the story. But she just kind of got progressively more infuriating. And so it didn't really ultimately work for me, but I could definitely see it being a great one to pick up in the fall. And I think it's going to be so hit or miss. The unreliable narrator aspect to the story is something I think that it's going to be really dependent on the reader, whether it clicks for them or not. So I'd still recommend it. I just think that her decision making irritated me a little bit, uh, a little bit too much. <laughs> After that, we have The Thorns Remain. This is one that I did happen to see the average rating, and the average rating is kind of on the lower side, and I very much disagree with that average rating. <laughs> so I thought this might be one of the most underrated for me. There is, of course, a difference between underrated and underhyped, and I think we use them synonymously sometimes, but I'm saying literally I think that its average rating, I personally would expect it to be a little bit higher. So the setup for the story is, it's also somewhat historical fiction. We follow a young, young woman who has a very difficult life in the way of labor. It's very labor intensive. She lives in this very rural area. It's very small. There's a very small population and everybody knows everybody. And you can clearly tell that there was a war recently that caused the numbers that were already so small in this village to drop even further. And it feels like collectively everybody's trying to kind of overcome their grief. Along with the war, there was also a flu that wiped out a lot of the villagers. And so there's this sense of everybody's kind of trying to just get through the day, get through their work and drink and be merry when they have off time. But everybody's kind of suppressing how they actually feel, which is very sad. And that is true of our main character as well. So very quickly, you see this rural environment, you see how hard she works. And I think the author did a great job of actually capturing what it's like to have just day to day to day so much to get done, whether that be dealing with food, dealing with other people who are injured, trying to help those who are elderly in the village, having to milk the cows and work with the animals, patch up the roof. There's just always something to be done. And that to me really immersed me in the story. It didn't just feel like something that was told to me and then I'm expected to believe it. It really played a role in the main character's life. And like I said, it immersed me in the story. It, it felt very much like the show Don't Tell part. I can see some people maybe getting bored with some of the day-to-day -day chores our character has to take care of, but I really liked it. I also liked the way that we implemented the overcoming of grief, but not being able to put your life on pause just because you're grieving, you still have to keep going. And so I think that was tied with the amount of labor that we see our main character having to, to do all the time. But regardless, I haven't even gotten to really the fantasy elements of the story. At the very beginning, our main character and her friends, which are primarily villagers that are around the same age as her, they go off into the forest and they're drinking and they're like, what are we going to do with our lives? What city are you going to go to? And they're talking about their futures and they're just being fun young people and being merry and drinking and dancing. And then things start to become really sinister and our main character is realizing how long have we been dancing and who are these people that are suddenly here. And she happens to grab onto someone who she cared about, their medal from when they were in the war. And that happens to have iron in it. And it makes her able to see how sinister the beings around them are. She runs. And then when she wakes up, she wakes up in her bed and thinks, wow, I had a weird dream. And then it starts to dawn on her like, where are my friends? And all of her friends are gone. And everyone in the village thinks they've been gone for a while. And she seems like the only person that knows that that's not the truth. And then she starts to realize, are the Fae real? And did the Fae take all of my friends? And there's only one other person in the village who uh, who is very wary of the Fae and that she can confide in and talk to. And so she decides, I have to try to find my friends. I have to try to get my friends back. And she ends up going back into the forest and striking a deal and many deals to follow that one with what seems like a lord among the fae and 
that's kind of where the fantasy elements take place. We don't ever really remove the historical fiction elements, and you start to see how much it can really weigh on her when she's the only person trying to get her friends back, and it feels like nobody else, including her friends' parents and things like that, actually realize how dire the circumstances are. Everybody in the village starts to kind of look at her odd because they're like, why is she behaving so weird? Why does she keep going out to the forest? Which creates a whole other level of stakes, in my opinion, because then you're seeing the way that everybody is wondering, is uh, is the grief getting to her? What I, It's just so sad, the way that she's... so, And, it, and you see the way that small rural village environment starts to affect things. So I really liked it. I think that on surface level, you can go into this and just read it as a fae story. Fae that are more folklore, and really, truly, like in the back of the book, the author talks about the different kinds of fae, and the ones that appear, they look more like dogs, or the ones that you're going to find within a swamp. And you see these throughout the story, but there's also kind of in the back, it will tell you this one you can find in different folklore, and sometimes it appears like this, and sometimes it appears like this. And so the rules of how the Fae interact with the humans are present in this much more than in a lot of the other Fae stories I've read. Point being, you you can go into it and think this is just a Fae story, but there was so much to it in the way of overcoming grief. How do you define yourself? What do you do after when it feels like you're not just mourning the loss of a person, but the loss of the life that you thought you were going to have? I thought that was all done beautifully, and I think also the entire story you can see as a metaphor for being in a very manipulative relationship, uh, whether that be romantic or it being a platonic relationship or something with a parent or anything like that. Just the way in which she has to interact with the Fae and the way the Fae start to make her feel like she's reliant on them. and. They tempt her with certain things. There was just a lot to it that I thought really had a great amount of depth. So definitely really liked this one. Would definitely recommend. It is a little, it is a little bit on the day-to-day -day slower pace side, but I quite liked it. Last we have The Salt Grows Heavy, and this one is horror, fantasy horror, and it's also body horror. So there's going to be some very disturbing things within this. And it's also a novella. It's extremely short, so you could probably get through it pretty quickly. Although I will say the vocabulary in this is pretty intense. <laughs> so just know that you could get through it pretty quickly because it's short, or maybe it could take a while because you have to constantly be like, what did, what's this paragraph? What is this sentence even trying to convey? I really liked the writing. I thought it was quite mesmerizing. I thought it was very engaging, and I thought it was really fitting to the tone overall of the story, because this is basically if you took The Little Mermaid and after The Little Mermaid has come to be on land and she is with a man, then after that, what if she bore children and they pretty much just killed everybody? <laughs> that's, that's where we start. And so we're following this woman mermaid, uh, and it's very eerie. She's not just like, look at me, I wear a shell bikini top and I have a pretty green tail. It's not that kind of a mermaid at all. It's violent type of mermaid. And she is paired with this doctor, a plague doctor, and they just kind of travel together. And then they come across this area where people are convincing small children to partake in some odd experiments. And then there's kind of questions that arise in, as a result of the morals of what's transpiring and the willingness. And it's a very odd story. I definitely wouldn't say I disliked it, but I don't know that I loved it either. I almost feel like I would want to go back and read it again. And it very much is looking at, it's sort of a re-examining of fairy tales and a re-examining of the way people in history are seen de depending on how that time period viewed those people. If we were to look back on those stories now, is there actually something quite disturbing about how everything is conveyed? So if you find that you're the kind of person that has a great appreciation for really great writing, then I think that this one would be right up your alley. I, again, I don't know that I can say I liked it. And I'm also not sure how, I don't quite know what I like with horror. This one was gruesome, but it didn't scare me. <laughs> Some of the things I'm like, oh, that's kind of icky, but that was it. Like I didn't, 
I, I don't know that I had visceral reactions to it. Um, I think I had wished, for me, I wished it was a little longer, which I know is a pre pretty fairly consistent thing people say of shorter works. Um, it didn't need to be, but I think I wanted a little bit more story and a little bit more context for what the heck was happening because it's pretty disturbing and odd. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the point of the, of the novella. So it didn't need it. It's just, I think what would have made it something more to my liking because I am more story. I, I'm a person that prefers story and characters and I it just didn't really feel like that's what that book was. But anyway, that's it for some new fantasy. I would love to hear your thoughts on these. And then also what are some new fantasy books that you've been picking up? Thanks so much for watching though. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll see you later. Bye.